Hi, I'm Megan Blanchett with O'Reilly Media. I'm here with James Pusiowski, Professor of Computer Science at Brandeis University, and Amber Stubbs, postdoc at SUNY Albany. Why is it helpful to create your own corpus for machine learning? I think the first thing to think about when looking at a machine learning task is what are you trying to learn? What's the goal? And that will be the determinant for creating the gold standard, which will be the training data for the machine learning algorithm. So machine learning is essentially identifying a target function. I want to train an algorithm that will approximate some task, the learning function. And that would be the target function. And that is, I want to be able to classify the different genre of articles. I want to be able to identify diseases in texts. Uh, or whether someone likes or doesn't like my movie or my product. And so the, the idea is that the data preparation step is the annotation. Machine learning can look at raw data, but only to a certain extent will that be what you're really looking for. There are limitations to just doing unsupervised learning, which is essentially clustering, and there are limitations to using the bag of words or n-gram features which are just literally using the raw text and then creating features that go into supervised learning algorithms just on the basis of the words. Those are also quite limiting. They're, they're remarkably good. Naive Bayes and Maxent classifiers can do remarkably good, good classification. But typically now people in specific tasks are looking at much more refined goals for what they're trying to learn, and th that's just not, uh, that's not sufficient. So they need to annotate the corpus with mm -hmm. additional specifications. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a, a set of data that may already be annotated, so like a lot of people use the IMDB data sets, you know, they look at the genres and things for the movie plot summaries and all that. Um, even if you have, you download that entire set of data, you still need to do some curation to make an, a corpus that you can actually use for machine learning. I mean, if nothing else, you're probably going to want to take out the data that's not in English um, because your classifier is probably going to work best on one language at a time. Uh, you might need to make sure that there's, you know, certain amounts of different things if you want to focus on maybe identifying action movies or something like that. You'd actually have to go in and, and to create a corpus, so something that's like usable for machine learning. Um, from the, the entire data set, which might be too big to, to really feasibly run machine learning on or uh, just might not really focus on what your goal is. So whatever you're trying to achieve, your corpus needs to reflect that. Right. So another example uh, of what Amber was saying is let's say that you as a company are trying to, to uh, track the reception of your products, your software or your shoes or whatever it might be, or just your services. And the one way to do that essentially is to take the data that's available from online reviews, uh, Twitters, blogs, anything that could be potentially incorporated and then uh, processed. Now, the, the data set that you have just by collecting this is already a corpus. It has metadata in it. There is metadata in the links, uh, in the way that it's been encoded in XML or HTML. But that and, and, and you can already do classification and sentiment uh, analysis on just the, the words that are there. That's called bag of words analysis, or what we call n-gram uh, features. So you could, let's say, just on the basis of those features alone, distinguish positive and negative reviews of your software or your cameras or, or your services towards shipping shoes, for example. But to get to more detailed and subtle interactions and also to know, well, who's actually positively reviewing. What's the demographics of this? You need to have a way of preparing the data set, and that involves the annotation step. Data, like for sentiment analysis, some people will tell you, you know, my review is positive, my review is negative, and that might not capture all the subtleties. You know, they might say overall it's good, but these parts are really bad. So sentiment analysis can be really important. There's been some movement to uh, use machine learning to detect whether or not someone maybe has a disease or would be qualified to participate in a medical study. Um, that's not something that you can just throw a classifier at and, and determine, oh, this person, you know, bag of words, oh, this person clearly has diabetes. Um, even if you got decent results, you really need extremely accurate results if you're going to be looking at medical records. Right. So <laughs> in the context of the, the do medical domain, uh, I think the important thing is that with evidence-based medicine and working with healthcare professionals, 
the importance, uh, as Amber was saying, is to get things right, to make sure you're getting all the information. So recall is that term from a text if you're going to be t doing something automatically and learning and identifying things with the algorithm has to be extremely high. Then you present it in a way mm -hmm. that's useful and interactive to the medical, the healthcare professional. And that's, I think, what people are now moving towards in evidence-based medicine and right. clinical note analysis and other areas like that. Right, so to bring it back around, it's really important to have a corpus and to, to put in that effort because without making sure that the data you feed the machine learning is good, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, you have to have some sense of how accurate your machine learning is going to be. And having a, a gold standard corpus is really, really the best way to do that. Right, so it all comes back to the goal. Why mm -hmm. am I doing the annotation? Mm -hmm. and it's the goal. I, what do I want to achieve by designing a learning algorithm that uh, the, gold can't, the gold corpus, the gold standard corpus, will be the training set for? Mm -hmm. What are some of the different methods for creating a corpus? Uh, sort of the traditional method in computational linguistics is to have human annotators go in and mark up your data with whatever uh, specification best reflects what you're trying to achieve. So James and I have worked on TimeML, which is a way to look at temporal events and you know the times and how they relate to each other. Um, so we have you know we have a whole specification for what we're looking at, a whole set of tags that was created just for that task and people go in and say here's a time, here's, you know, it says Tuesday but I know the calendar date is this and they relate it back to something. Um, you know, here's an event, here's how the event re relates to that time assuming you know, and of course time is really complicated so you don't always know. Um, so it's sort of the traditional, so then people, uh, the annotation is completed, you compare annotators uh, results, you check to you know, find where there's probably errors and you create what's called a, a gold standard. Um, but that can be really time consuming and really expensive. So people have been looking at other ways to get those annotations. Um, so one thing that people will do is, like, like I was saying before, use the IMDB data, you know, things that are already annotated. Um, they might not be quite as good necessarily as something that you know, a, a trained person looked at individually, but they're, they're usually not bad. Um, other things people do are look at like crowdsourcing, so Amazon Mechanical Turk is a you know, service where people can go in and say, hey, could someone tell me, you know, is this a, is this a temporal expression, you know, or what, what do you think this word means in this context? Um, there's pros and cons to doing things like that, but for the most part, you know, it's, it, it has been reasonably successful. Um, and, and before one even starts the annotation process, you have to think, well, where am I going to get the data that we're actually going to do the annotation over, the metadata? Uh, there's plenty of language. The, the problem is you need to come up with the right, the right sampling so that you're representative of enough of the phenomenon or phenomena that you're trying to model. So, for example, if you were going to the time and event and temporal relationships um, type of annotation, if you are looking at, let's say, just the uh, in-house corporate emails about scheduling meetings with one another, that's a very biased sampling of the types of temporal expressions you would see in language. So you'll see uh, available on Tuesday after 3, or every Monday I'm out at lunch at 1, or something like that. All these kinds of expressions are recurring temporal expressions, such as as every two, three, not after five. And that's not necessarily representative of what you'd find in, let's say, newspaper articles, where you don't really see that kind of uh, frequent temporal expression very often, uh, or in Twitters, or in blogs. So you have to have a representative sample of the language. And that's a really uh, important part, because you're annotating. As Amber said, you collect the annotators, you come up with this specification, and we'll talk about that with the, the cycle, the process cycle. But the original data has to be representative so that the annotations are reflecting an actual good sampling of the community because the machine learning algorithm is going to be sampling the features from this annotation to train the algorithms. If the algorithms are so biased on a very small sampling, they won't extend to larger environments. They'll be overfitted. Uh, to a smaller community, and they won't be useful for other, other corpora, other communities. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the MATTER annotation development process. MATTER stands for Model, Annotate, Train, Test, Evaluate, and Revise. 
that's a term I started using around four or five years ago, essentially to, to capture what uh, we felt was were the best practices in the field of computational linguistics. And so the term is is unique, but the best practices have been around by the best labs and the best researchers. Essentially, the idea is to, uh, as we were saying before, always be focused on the task that you have in mind in order to model the phenomenon. So for example, if we're trying to model something very simple, identifying spam and not spam in my email, then the model essentially is just going to reflect that I'm, I'm going to have this binary classification or maybe a graded scalar classification. Some things are not in the, some things are in the middle, maybe certain types of ads are not really spam. And then uh, the modeling essentially gives rise to the specification. Specification is a way to create, let's say, typically an XML markup, which creates the metadata tags, which is the elements, the relations, the attributes that become the, the wrappers for the text. That then gives rise to a guideline. You want to talk about the guideline, how it's different from the specification? Right. So the guideline is basically the instructions for the annotators that say how exactly you're supposed to use these tags. So when is, I mean, Tuesday might always be a time, but you can have events that also function as time. So after the party, also the party. You know, when do you want someone to annotate that as a time, as an event? How is that going to work? Um, so the, the guidelines are how you actually have the, how you actually apply the tags to your corpus, which you previously selected. Um, and then basically what happens is uh, you do that on a sample of your corpus, you look at it, and then you say, oh, these results are terrible. We have to do it again. And so within the matter cycle, there's a smaller thing that we call the mama cycle, or the babbling phase of the whole annotation process. Um, because it can be very hard to get annotators to achieve a certain level of agreement that'll mean that your corpus is going to be good for machine learning. Right. It's mama because you're cycling through model annotate, model annotate, mm -hmm. and just right. iterating over this. Right. And that's the bad one. Yeah. So because so, every time your annotators, you know, are misusing a tag, maybe you, your instructions are bad. Maybe that's the wrong tag. Maybe you really yeah. have to go back and, and look at your specification and say, hang on, this is just not really what we're trying to do. But once you do get some good results and you can, you know, they're good enough that you can combine them, create your gold standard, then you can get back into the, the training and testing phases, which is really the heart of the machine learning. Right. So but then in the training, you've got this uh, gold standard. And from that, you need to do the classic machine learning task of the feature selection. And that's a lot of experimentation as well. What of the features that we've encoded in this body, which is the gold standard, and is a reflection of the specification. What of those features will be the most useful for training the algorithm to actually recognize all these different things that we've encoded? And that's the feature selection process. And a lot of different types of computations go into figuring out what's the best way to um, use what feature and how to put them all together. And that also will determine, to a large extent, what type of machine learning to algorithm to use, uh, and whether you want something which would be a, a generative algorithm or a discriminative algorithm, uh, whether you're trying to tag things in sequence, if, if, if it's a sequence induction phenomena, like, let's say, creating this, the constructional parse of a sentence, it's called sequence induction. That requires a different type of learning algorithm. Um, and then you basically iterate over this with training and testing which have been created into different corpora, mm -hmm. if you want to mention. Well, what divided. I mean, yeah, because it is it is in some ways a science. I mean, you don't want to go in and you know, uh, contaminate your, your data sets. You need to have a way to evaluate at the end and say, well, here's how we know how good this is going to work on at least a similar corpus or maybe out in the wild because we held out this, this test data. And that allows you to say, and you know, we trained all this and we're getting, you know, X percent accuracy or, you know, whatever precision and recall, here's our metrics, here's how we know how well we're doing here. Um, which is really also why the gold standard, you know, having that corpus is important. So you can say, have an idea of how well you're actually doing what you set out to do. Right. So you, that's the evaluation phase and you go and, you know, check and see how well you're doing, maybe figure out where it's failing and then maybe you have to go back and revise your model again because it turns out you're missing something really important. But right. So the gold standard goes towards training but also evaluating. 
and that's the test. You know, did I succeed? Did I fail? Mm -hmm. And then revising is essentially to go back and think through almost any phase of the process. Where did we go wrong? How could we improve? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the matter cycle. What do you see coming next in the machine learning field? I think it's exciting, it's somewhat terrifying how much data we have. The term of the year is big data, and there's so much what appeared to us, uh, appears to us as unchecked or unbridled enthusiasm with big data. There are a couple of things about this uh, which are, I think, important to distinguish. One is just the, the hardware and the algorithms for just handling that much throughput, that much data. And that's very exciting and very interesting. On the other hand, to just think that we can take these, these data, these data sets, and process them raw is, I think, just uh, not thinking through the problem. There's the data, as we've been saying, are coming through they have minimal annotation. They may have metadata tags. There may be some classifications. And of course, you always have the words. That's the, the n-gram features themselves can be used as features for learning. But I think what's really exciting uh, in the future is the way that mixing small sets of supervised learning uh, strategies, so small gold standards, in some cases quite small, and then integrating that with completely unlabeled data. And this is a technique called uh, uh, semi-supervised learning that is being explored uh, rather, uh, rather successfully and it's an exciting movement in computational linguistics as well as in other areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the techniques are varied, but there's uh, essentially uh, the goal is to try to, as, as successfully as possible, use a really very excellently uh, annotated gold corpus of a small size and then let it loose into the wild, bring in, in very restricted ways usually, uh, the unlabeled data and mix it together in this sort of integrated training phase. And that's really quite exciting. Um, I guess crowdsourcing is another very exciting thing to uh, think about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really it can be when used appropriately, which can be very hard when you're asking you know people that you haven't necessarily trained um, to provide data. Um, I think another thing that things are really going to go towards is look is using machine learning and things more like you know medicine and some very uh, specific and high level things. You know, you're, there's a lot more movement towards getting you know, systems to actually do things like you know, find people who, can, who should participate in medical studies or, or you know, uh, monitor people who might be at risk for diseases. As far as I know, that's, those aren't really implemented in hospitals yet because they're still being developed, but I think that's something that's really going to be important in the next couple of years. Another couple of uh, another exciting area, I think, is uh, multimodal integration of of annotations. Let's say from images and other data sets, for example, Flickr data or other images. How you integrate that with language descriptions, and so that's another area where semi-supervised learning or techniques such as co-training could be very successful. Let's say you have an annotation of an image, and it shows your ant in front of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and uh, so you have the landmarks in the image, which you can identify with various types of image processing software, but you also have a description of the spatial relationship between them. So that, as well as, as a lot of other multimodal uh, interactions, such as the um, uh, in a TV screen, the image that's being shown and the text that's the byline of the image, and then you have the talking head basically describing some incident that's, that's going on. So, so these are annotation tasks. There's an integration uh, question of how do I annotate images with language? How do I annotate gestures and pointing and things like that? So that's another very exciting area uh, for the okay. future. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.